Hi. Good, or, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cyber Tuesday. We do these once a month. We call them Cyber Tuesdays, and they are brought to you by ITAC, which is um, we're a non-profit industry, um, which is basically all the indigenous and multinational organizations all along the Atlantic Galway coast. And we bring together, we have social events, we have network events, and we have um, regular talks, with, including our Cyber Tuesdays. And I guess today is... Mike Harris, he's a partner from Grant Thornton, and his role is obviously cybersecurity and forensics. So Mike started out life before cybersecurity was cybersecurity, um, and he has a technical background. He's done some pen, pen testing, but you know, right now he advises clients on a range of things from data protection to cybersecurity to risk. Um, and he's going to share with us today the economic cost of cybercrime. And we have to thank um, Boris Johnson and the UK Tory government for giving us such a topical um, point of view today, because I don't know if you know, but last week they announced that crime had gone down 14%, when in reality it had actually gone up 14%. But they decided to exclude cybercrime um, or any computer crime or fraud which actually makes up, I think, 47% of crime. So I'm looking forward to Mike's insights on that one amongst everything else. So Mike, over to you. And Andrea, thank you very much. Um, as Andrea said, my name is Mike Harris. I'm a cybersecurity partner in Grant Thornton. I, I, I've probably been working in cyber for, for, for much longer than I care to remember. So it's been interesting to see some of the changes and differences down through the years. When I started looking at, at, at what, what is now cybersecurity, it was very much seen as, I suppose, a niche, -ish, a, niche, a niche issue in specific industries, for example, financial services or the telecommunications industry. But I suppose the big change that's happened in the last number of years, it's now a problem that organizations and individuals, you know, large, large organizations, small organizations need to deal with. Um, and I, I suppose one of the things... Um, we, we, we thought was missing was really a, an understanding of, well, how much is this crime and this activity actually costing the Irish economy? And we did a piece of research work back in 2014 to try and, um, I, I suppose, estimate, and, and, and really the numbers here are, are only by their nature estimates of what cybercrime was costing the Irish economy. And now we've now redone it, the 2021 version. So we'll talk a little bit about, I suppose, why you would want to estimate the the the, the, um, the um, impact of cybercrime? We'll talk a little bit about the actual cost and some of the headline numbers of it, um, and then I'm going to talk about maybe some of the different components um, of cybercrime, of cybercrime costs that we tend to see out there, and then I'm going to talk about maybe the impact on on businesses, on individuals, and on government, and maybe I'll finish up with some um, with some um, recommendations or maybe some thoughts to leave you with. Um, one of the things. Um, I, I will I will do. If you want to ask questions, please ask them as we go along. I will leave time at the end um, to answer questions as well. Um, I, I suppose in terms of the overall the overall economic cost of cybercrime, you know, cybercrime has been posing a and, and and I think the word is dramatically increasing risk for both organisations and individuals in Ireland, but also internationally and across the world. You know, there's daily reports of attacks take, taking place. And, and, and the one thing is clear, and I'll talk about some examples of this later, later cyber criminals do not distinguish their victims. They simply uh, exploit whatever they can with the intent usually to steal funds, information, or cause disruption, although even causing disruption is, tend, is, is, is even now being tended to, be, tended to be done with the ultimate aim to be financial gain. Um, the cyber criminals, they are developing and boosting their attacks at an alarming rate. They're exploiting the fear and certainty caused by the pandemic, and I suppose that in, in many cases unstable social and economic um, situation around the world. There is an even higher dependency though for, for countries like ourselves on conductivity, on digital infrastructure. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't go to a conference without organizations talking about digitization and how they will increase their use of digital technologies. Um, and, and I suppose ultimately, that digitization coupled with you know, the lockdown has dramatically increased the opportunity for cyber criminals both to intrude into networks, but also to carry out their attacks. Um, I, I think as I go through the numbers, you will see that Irish businesses are quite vulnerable to cyber criminals. Now, 
that's not just an Irish issue. That's an issue all over the world. I don't think it's a, a specific Irish problem. You know, Irish organizations ultimately need to be thinking about planning cybersecurity investments, thinking about their ability to detect and react to data security breaches. You know, one, one of the pieces, one of the things that is key, and I think it was originally um, um, said by a, a director of the FBI, it's no longer a question of if an Irish business will be the victim of a cyber attack. It's a question of when it will happen. And in fact, the ability of a business um, to detect and react to an attack is really the key factor in limiting the impact of, of that attack in the current climate. I suppose, you know, COVID-19, which is, you know, you can't go to a talk without someone mentioning COVID-19, but from a cyber perspective, I think it's interesting as it persists in various parts of the world, there will be a, a continuing increase in cyber crime. Um, and I suppose, you know, working from home and remote working has gone from, you know, has become mainstream. It's the way we live and it's the way we work now, but that's giving more and more opportunity to cyber criminals. Um, you know, they're building activities to, to target the fact that people are from home and to use vulnerabilities that organizations have typically had in their you know, remote access infrastructure, and they're now targeting that. And I, I think also, you know, even as COVID-19 cases decline, you know, the cyber criminals, and they've done this historically, will adapt the fraud schemes, the attacks that they're doing, and they want to exploit, you know, the post pandemic the ultimately post-pandemic, although we're maybe a little bit off that yet, aiming to target organizations, but also to large target ultimately the largest number of victims, which gives us the largest bang for the buck. Because I think it's important to remember that cyber criminals are, um, are ultimately in it for the money. It's big business, it's organized. And it's sophisticated. I think that's the that's the challenge for 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 for, for many organisations. And I think it's it's um, it's worth I suppose pausing for a minute just to talk about why would you really want to estimate um, the cost of cybercrime? And I think you know the increasing volume that we've seen of cyber attacks that we've seen over the last number of years, you know, ha ha has I suppose increased the, the need for people to safeguard their data more and more. You know, if you look at if you look at the stats out there, I think the the the, the CSO last year mentioned that you know household internet and access in Ireland is is now at ninety three percent, up from ninety one percent, and the year before. So people are dependent, and businesses are dependent on internet and, and related technologies. We're more Hi. and more. Yes. Can I just check? Are we supposed to see your slides moving on, or you no, still on your starting yes, slide? Yes, no, no. Hey, play with, bear with me. The slides aren't going to move yet. That's uh, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. No, we're on a minimalist slides, guys. Minimalist slides. Um, so just to talk a little bit about, um, I, I suppose the motivations, and and you know, the, in some quarters there has been a feeling that maybe cybercrime isn't as big an issue as 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 we think it is, and some of the challenges are that cybercrime tends to be massively underreported. You know, I think we're, see we're seeing this beginning to change. And Andrea mentioned, for example, in the UK government leaving out cybercrime out of their crime stats. But traditionally, I think even at the moment, the amount of cybercrime is underreported. And why is that? Well, one is from an organizational perspective, the, the, the fear of reputational damage. You know, often the victims don't know who to report cybercrime to. And the victims are often aware sometimes that the case, particularly businesses, that the attack has actually even taken place. You know, so so you know, businesses if they're not aware, it's it's difficult for them to actually um, put to actually allocate resources in the correct way. You know, and 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 in fact, many organisations you know um, know about the risk but tend not to do something about it because ultimately they're not they're not really clear on how much this could potentially cost them. The Institute of Directors last year did a survey of about a thousand um, business leaders in Ireland, and ninety five percent of those came back and said. That cybercrime is really important and managing cybercrime is really important for their business. But actually, less than 55% of them actually had a cyber strategy to defend themselves. Um, and only 44% of them had employee um, awareness programs in place. So while they think it's important, the motivation to actually do something has been, has been lacking. And hopefully, um, when, we, when we try and bring this in stark economic terms, it'll make, it'll make it a little bit more um, straightforward for organizations to um, to, to, to understand and to manage. Um, so in terms of headline costs, um, based on the survey we've done, based on the, sorry, the research that we've done this year, the total economic cost of cybercrime in Ireland in 2020 was 9.6 billion euros. Um, and just to put that in context, when we did the similar uh, research with a similar methodology back in 2014, it was 600 and just under 700 
um, million um, euros. So there's been a very dramatic increase in the last number of years. And I think, you know, intuitively based on the number of cyber attacks that we see in the press, and that's suppose the general coverage that cyber crime gets, that's probably not all that much of a uh, all, all that much of a surprise. And it, it's broken down into a number of different areas. And I'll talk maybe on the next slide a little bit about the different the different um, types of costs that tend to be associated with cybercrime. But I suppose from a headline perspective, um, both ransomware attacks and, you know, ransomware is where um, a piece of malicious software is introduced into an organization's IT systems. It then moves around the network, um, taking away access to systems and to files and to data, et cetera, essentially encrypting it. And then they require the victims to pay some sort of, um, um, there's an extortion attempt, they have to pay a certain amount of money in order to get access back. And we've seen some very high profile examples of that recently, um, for example, um, the HSE example, which I'll talk about maybe in a little bit more detail later. But the, the, the amount of ransomware and related computer um, malicious um, software attacks, malware attacks, whether that's rated to phishing, that's doubled in the last number of years. So that's got that that that's that that's got um very, very large. But what's interesting from our perspective is that um this has been driven by very much the types of attacks that the criminals are carrying out, but also I suppose the 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 responses that organizations are are, are taking to some of these attacks in order to defend themselves. And I think that's 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 actually quite important to think about as well. Um, so if you if you think about the types of costs that you you tend to have um, in these organizations, um, it tends to be broken down into a number of of um, a number of different areas. And um, I suppose very simply, you know, there are a combination of different costs, the direct costs, indirect costs, and defense, defense costs. And I'll talk about what each of these are in, in, in a couple of minutes. And I suppose when you're trying to get an overall handle on what the economic cost is, you need to consider each of these, both from a individual perspective, so cost to individuals, but also on businesses and the government itself. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, the different types of costs, uh, the direct costs are probably the more immediate and quantifiable costs um, when, you, when you're the victim of cyber attack. Um, it's the monetary cost based on losses and damages that are impact that are inflicted on the victim of the attack. So this could be, for example, money stolen out of a bank account or from a credit card information. Um, it could be the um, cost of, of recovering and putting the systems back to the way they were after a cyber attack. And that actually can be, quite, can, be, can, be, can be quite a large expense, particularly for larger organizations. And many organizations actually retain cyber insurance to deal with some of those, um, well, some of those costs. Um, and I suppose, they're the, the sort of more quantifiable things. The indirect costs, which are a little bit more difficult in many cases to estimate, these are the, the, the sort of monetary value of the opportunity cost inflicted not only on the individuals, but on wider society. So it's the loss of trust in a bank after a cyber attack. It's that loss of business for an organization, for example, an e-commerce retailer in the event, how many transactions do they lose if they're the victims of a cyber attack? Because people perceive them not to be secure and do not want to deal with them. Or it, it, cyber attacks in many cases can cause customer churn, customers leaving to go to your competitors. Or ultimately, it may be a business opportunity that's not, 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 that's not realized. An organization may be the victim of intellectual property theft and can never then bring the product to market because someone's got there before them and there's a monetary loss associated with that or the IP becomes effectively um, useless. And then I suppose the last part of it is the defense costs. So this is, you know, the, the monetary costs are both prevention and reaction costs for an organization or an individual. It's having the firewalls in place, it's having the antivirus software in place, spam filters, you know, doing a training and awareness program for, for, for your staff having appropriate fraud detection and tracking mechanisms within the organization. And ultimately the cost of society is, 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 is the sum of all of these things. And that's what's coming to the 9.6 billion. Um, I, I think it's interesting um, you know, in terms of the growth that we've seen over the last number of years, that's very consistent with the growth that we've seen um, in cyber attacks internationally. Uh, and I suppose the increased cost of cyber attack internationally. There's lots of numbers out there because you know ultimately this is an estimate, but what would the increase we've seen in Ireland is very, very consistent with the with the with the increase we've seen globally. And of course, for a economy like Ireland where we have a dependency on technology, you know, we have a large tech, tech you know, tech industry, we have a large multinational um, it, um, sector as well, 
I think cyber becomes even more important for Ireland Inc. than necessarily for other, other countries as well. And I think that's well worth um, bearing in mind. Um, so I suppose that sort of just gives you a, a sense of, I suppose, the high level numbers and where they come from. What I'd like to do now maybe is, 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 to, is to just spend a little bit of time talking about each of the sort of individual areas, let's bounce the slides on. And I'm gonna talk first maybe a little bit about um, the, cost, the cost of businesses. Uh, and the cost of, that businesses have to deal with from a cyber perspective. And I, and I think, you know, um, one of the challenges um, in estimating the cost, the cyber cost of businesses, there's many different, um, there's many different elements to it. As I said, there's the direct cost when a cyber attack happens, you have to react to it. You maybe have to get specialized expertise to help you understand what happened and put your systems back the way they were, do a forensic analysis, provide reports, and may, for depending on what business sector, what sector you're in, although at most sectors, you know, that now handle personal data would have to do some form of reporting um, to regulators. And I think there's interesting stats out there. There's IBM estimated that the cost of a, an individual cyber breach in 2020 was about 3.4 million euros per breach. And that's gone up in 2021 to 3.7 million euros per breach. So you can imagine even for a small, on average, these breaches can be very, very costly. And also the numbers can be very, very large. And in some cases for organizations, um, they can be existential. They can cause, they can cost the organization so much money that can actually cause the organization um, 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 to cease to function. And I've seen examples in the last two years of ransomware attacks against organizations where not only did they attack the data that was directly stored in the, in the business, they actually attacked the backups, so the backups of the data. So it became very difficult for the organization actually to restore its data to the state it was before the attack. And in at least one case, it actually caused um, the business to go insolvent, the business had to stop trading. So it can be existential for organizations. And this is one of the challenges, particularly for larger organizations, is the costs associated with dealing with a cyber attack can be massive. And when we talk a little bit about the HSE later, like the cost can be very, very large in a very, very short um, period of time. And I think, you know, also from a business perspective, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, this is not a theoretical risk for organizations. You know, the National Cybersecurity Strategy, you know, 2019 to 2024, had some numbers in it where they were saying that 61% of, of Irish organizations, of all Irish organizations, have reported to, that they have fallen victim to a cybercrime um, in, 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 within a two-year period. And the average loss was about 3.1 million um, um, euros per event. So that's a, that's a very, very substantial amount of money and, and it's real. And, and many of the drivers from a business perspective are ransomware, are computer virus attacks. And you know, if you think about the modus operandi for many organized, or for many attackers, there tends to be an, an initial, I suppose, um, intrusion into the network. So they get some access into the organization's network. They don't necessarily do anything without access for an extended period of time. They may do a bit of reconnaissance across the network, understand what the organization has in place, what data do they have? What sort of defenses do they have? Are they monitoring the network? Is there lots of um, security controls in the network or not? In some cases, the initial attacker might sell that access to another attacker who may then actually carry out the attack. And in many cases, and we talk about the HSE again, they might deploy, for example, a ransomware um, attack. And many ransom, ransomware has gone from being something that was quite indiscriminate it was sent to lots of people and that still happens and you might get that's the sort of ransomware you may get on your home computer for larger organizations these are now much more sophisticated and targeted attacks they target specific organizations or specific industries um, they're effectively placed within the organization's network in order to cause the maximum damage and to maximize the potential um, that they would in fact pay um, they would in fact pay the ransom as part of the um, as part of the fraud, and that's something. And we are, and what we've seen in terms of that cost, that cost has doubled, if not if not more than doubled between 2014 and um, and and 2015. Um, I, I think it's also worth worth um, noting that you know um, 
insurers are increasingly interested in cyber. So now it's possible to get cyber insurance from a business perspective. So insurers are getting a good insight to the level of and types of cyber crime that's going on. Um, Hiscox, who are one of the sort of Lloyd's insurers based in London, did a cyber readiness report back in 2021. Um, and they, 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 they had information on about 300 Irish companies that they were involved in, they were involved in insuring. And 43% of those companies in that year had experienced at least one cyber attack. So that show, just shows you the extent of it. And I would argue that maybe the organizations that didn't report any cyber attacks didn't have the technology in place in order to appropriately monitor and respond to those types of cyber attacks. So I, so I think, you know, from a business perspective, very much been driven, in, you know, the costs have been very much driven by the proliferation of ransomware, particularly targeted ransomware, and of course, computer viruses, whether, you know, as part of a phishing attack or as part of the sort of background noise you tend to see on the network. And it's interesting if you go back like five or six years ago, it was felt that maybe um, computer viruses were something that was dying out, it was something that we were, we were beginning to manage and manage using some antivirus technology. But that sort of tide has turned in the last number of years and it's become a, 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 you know, an even greater problem than ever. And it's something that's going to be a challenge going forward as well. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the costs to um, to individuals, and you know, while you know, obviously the headlines for many organisations are go are are, are, go, are the, the headlines for many organisations, or sorry, for, for the many cyber headlines are going to be the impact on businesses and the impacts on large large organisations. But like that's not that's only a small part of it, and I think that's some of the challenges here. You know, more often than not. You know, this cost to individuals. I won't get everybody to put their hands up, but I, I, I would think if you if you um, surveyed any given room and asked, you know, how many people are the victims have been the victims of some form of cyber crime, you know, you get you get the majority of people putting their hands up now, and that would not necessarily have been the case been the case six or seven years ago, but it's even more. It, it certainly is the case now, um, and, and consumers. You know, and individuals, they're as vulnerable as ever to cyber attacks, and they're certainly as vulnerable as businesses are. And, and, and you know, we've seen a rise of online phishing scams over recent years. You know, if you looked, for example, at your email in your spam filter, you'd probably see that 80% of the emails that actually come into you on a day-to-day -day basis are actually blocked and never get to you in the first place because of the spam filters that have been put in place. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, which I think things you, things you, th gives you, gives you a good sense of it is the whole issue of sort of debit and credit card fraud, particularly the card not present, which tends, tends to be internet based. Um, the Irish Banking and Payments Federation in April 2020 said that there'd been a, you know, Irish consumers had lost about 12 million um, directly through credit and debit card fraud the first half of 2020. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's, that shows that you know that that's the direct losses. That's the actual monetary amount that was taken out of the account. But that doesn't include costs from you know changing the car details, other rectification that may happen, tracking down from a bank's perspective and investigating exactly what happens, reconciling losses and costs, and also you know it, it, it takes it takes um, I suppose focus for financial institutions away from other other tasks as well. But just to give you a sense of maybe how easy of this we about. You know, a year, maybe 18 months ago, we saw, I suppose, an increase of, of, of what's called form jacking type attacks and a number of high profile websites, some publicly, some it became public, but some it was handled in house, um, were, 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 were the victims of this so called form jacking. So, what form jacking? Basically, an attacker um, puts a piece of malicious code, typically JavaScript, um, a, a designed to steal credit card and payment details on the payment form of a web page, so the page where you're actually making a payment, where you're clicking, you put in your credit card details and you click go, and they would they would target those pages and put a piece of malicious code in there that would basically steal your credit card number. Um, and it, it's become very popular and very successful over the last number of years. In fact, the, the, the sort of average price on the black market for a stolen credit card number is now about 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 40 euros or so which is which is you know has fallen quite a bit but what what does that mean you know you can you can make a lot of money in a very short period of time um you know in terms of 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 a, a compromised um website and it doesn't take very many compromised account uh, compromised credit cards of websites because there are thousands of websites out there both internationally and in Ireland for example if you compromise 5,000 accounts you got 10 credit cards from each account 
at 40 euros, at, you know, at 40 euros, that's two million, which a cyber criminal can make in a very, very short period of time. And, and I suppose, you know, because individuals and because of the COVID world we've lived in, they've been driven online. You know, small businesses are providing the ability to um, buy, th buy their products online. They're putting up e-commerce sites often very, very quickly. But in addition, the consumers themselves, you know, because they haven't been going out, have been using these sites more. And that's something that the, that the cyber criminals have, act have very much taken as, as something that they could, they, could re they, could, they could really target. But I suppose what's even more interesting is maybe the interaction of cyber criminals, um, uh, sorry, of the of individuals, both personal lives and their work lives as well. And Microsoft did a survey in Ireland about a year ago, and there's some very interesting stats that come out of it. Um, about 43% of employees don't face any restrictions when accessing work documents while using their personal devices. So from an organizational perspective, that can be very dangerous that you're, you're not complied with the controls. More scarily, 33% of employees use the same passwords for work and personal accounts. So the user, the password that they use to log on for their work account is also the password that they might use to log on to their Twitter account or Gmail account or some other account on the internet. And what's the danger with that? Well, it, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, for many organize or for many um, individuals, their username and password combination, which is typically their email address plus their password, has actually already been compromised. And in many cases, it's been compromised um, repeatedly. So, for example, if one of those personal accounts had been compromised in a cyber attack and a big data breach and they're reusing passwords, then that password is out there. Um, and that password can be used by attackers to gain access maybe to their work environment, could be used to gain access to other more critical accounts that that individual uses. So, so that, that sort of reuse of passwords, I think, is a big challenge from a cyber perspective. Um, other stats were, you know, 30% of employees use personal email to share work materials, 20% of employees never receive training to protect themselves against a cyber attack. I think one of the things we're seeing and we have seen is that security awareness and employee training is critically important for organizations in terms of, in terms of protecting themselves and making sure that they've got appropriate um, cyber controls in place within within the within the organization. You know, we had we we've seen a number of examples in our work. We had a an organization, a financial financial services organization, um, about a year ago, um, where their CEO was targeted in a personal attack, where the individuals get access to their iCloud account and stole uh, uh, stole a number of documents and information out of the iCloud account, out of the iCloud account, were attempting to then um, get the individual in question to actually give them access into the corporate network um, by claiming that they'd found certain material that could be used against them. Um, and, and the CEO in question actually went to his organization and said, look, my personal account's been hacked. I'm having these problems. Um, but actually, the impact ultimately for the organization was they had to make a disclosure to the financial regulator over it because there was a number of pieces of um, business information that that individual had actually stored on their personal account that had been compromised. Um, so you can see that 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 blurring of the lines between personal accounts and business accounts can be can be a challenge both from that individual and both from an organizational perspective as well. And that's something that's 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 going to be more and more of a challenge, I think, as 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 we go along. Um, I, and I mentioned, you know, the cost of cybercrime for that twelve million. Well, like as I would say, you know, that's that's what has been reported, and that's what. Um, organizations have dealt with, but that's only the direct loss. It doesn't take into account the fact that some people won't, you know, are scared about using the internet, won't use credit card numbers or credit card information on the internet, or maybe, you know, um, the investigative costs that are associated with it. And for a lot of organizations, particularly organizations that, you know, are new getting into online um, um, and e-commerce type activities, the actual level of cyber, of, of credit card fraud that they have, depending on the types of things that they're selling, can actually be very, very large and does need to be managed proactively. Um, and in many cases, you know, pushing that maybe to your payment processor it do, isn't always the best idea, but really understanding maybe where, where orders come from and whether or not they're likely to be done with stolen credit cards is something that's going to be quite important going forward um, for many organizations. So, th so that just gives you a, a, a sense of that. What I'd like to talk about now, maybe for the last few minutes, is talk about, I suppose, the cost to government and many of the challenges 
that um, governments have had to had to deal with um, from a cyber perspective. And, and you know, this has been a, a challenge over the last um, the last number of years, uh, and there has been an impact you know, on the water society. And hopefully the reports that we've put together, which I, I'll give you the link at the very, very end so you can take a look at it yourselves. We give you an idea of some of the impact on wider society and the cost. And it does, you know, it does really push the need for government action around some of these things. You know, before the digital age, excuse me, started, there was little need to plan a budget for cybersecurity. You know, it wasn't something that was really considered. It might be something that, for example, um, you know, army networks or critical scientific networks may have looked at, and that's the way it was um, back in um, earlier times. Um, I'm actually just going to open up the chat. Um, I might answer some of those questions. As I just noticed, there was there was some questions there that that are moving on. Someone's asking about the slides are moving on. We got that. Um, what do I think about the underreporting of cybercrime? I, I think yeah, we, we talked about that a little bit earlier. And I think it is interesting. Um, I, I do think the, you know, the Guardi in Ireland and other law enforcement have gone much more focused on their ability to respond and actually deal with cybercrime. And I think that's driving more reporting of it. But I do still think there's massive underreporting of cybercrime. I think for a lot of organizations, they see it as something where there's little remedy that they're going to get, and all they get is bad press. And I think, you know, until a time where it, 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 there isn't really a stigma on an organization, because organizations can spend quite a lot of money on defending against cyber attack and still be the victim of a cyber attack. Okay, of course, you don't make the investment, it's much more likely, but it is always going to be a challenge for organizations of all shapes and sizes. Um, next question was around, does Mike think we should move? Sorry, I'm just trying to scroll this. Does Mike think we should move um, from it's not? Um, yeah, no, it's assumed breach mindset. So I, I think people are, and I, I think I may have alluded to that. You know, I, I think for a lot of organizations, you, you spend not only on defensive controls to making sure that you've got your antivirus, that you're doing your patching, so making sure you're updating your software to the latest versions, um, that you're managing access. You do also have to consider, well, what would I do in the event of a cyber attack? What is that? It's making sure you have the ability to, to I suppose, detect unusual activity in your IT systems, but also have a plan of what you would do in the event of an attack, and actually have practiced that plan as well. I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think, I think organizations, I think that time has come, organizations have to be thinking about that. It's not good enough just to think about defensive controls. You have to think about what you might do in the event of an actual cyber attack. Um, can we trust on zero, zero trust, what this means for end users? Like zero trust is, is really, I, I think it's something that a lot of organizations are moving towards. I think it's a journey. And I think there's challenges for organizations while they're making a, tra a transition to zero trust. We can maybe talk about more of that at the end if you want. Um, yeah, I think the copy of the webinar will be will be given around. Um, and then the last one. Um, yeah, two-factor on Office 365, while two-factor is good, no authentication control is going to be 100%. There's always a possibility that there has been some sort of compromise, whether, you're comprom whether your phone has been compromised or whether someone has done some form of SIM hijacking, for example, to, to take over your SIM and, and get the text messages. Nothing is going to be 100%. I think from a security perspective, it's all about making it a little bit harder each time. So just having more control than you had before. So what you want to do, the, the attackers, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to, they're not going to go after um, the most secure organizations, they go after the low hanging fruit. And you don't want to be the low hanging fruit. So I think that's the challenge, particularly for smaller businesses, is to make sure you're not the low hanging fruit. You're not the easiest. That you may not have all the controls you might want to have in place, but you're better than the average. And I think that's really sort of important thing to, 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 to think about. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the cost of government, as I said, and, and, and you know, I, I do think that, you know, Ireland, we are a country where there is a high uptake and the use of di uh, digital um, technology, you know, and, and you know, the, 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 the internet and the inter inter infrastructure that supports all that is really, really important. And I think it is part of our critical national infrastructure, and we've seen over the last number of years you know, fairly substantial changes to how a number of organ how many organizations are regulated from a cyber perspective. Um, and we see, you know, organizations like um, 
water supply, transport companies, etc., internet companies now have much heavier, heavier regulation upon them in terms of the types of things um, they need to do from a cybersecurity perspective. And that's been one part of the government response. You know, the national cyber security, uh, national cyber cybersecurity strategy that was published, you know, talks about um, about 70 critical national infrastructure operators that have been designated as um, I, I suppose organizations that will be will be managed very carefully from a security perspective. And I know there's about 20 initiatives within the national cyber strategy. And I think ultimately this is very broad front and center from a government perspective because of the fact that disruption to systems used by Irish citizens or services offered to Irish citizens by the government and businesses, you know, it does, it does um, really have a I suppose provide a direct threat to the to, to the state itself and the economy and the lives of you know millions of citizens. I think we don't have, we we only have to look at the ransomware attack that took place against HSE um, last year, where you know the entire Irish healthcare system was affected. You know, in many cases, they had to revert to paper systems while their IT systems were online. You know, th- th- these attackers are looking at, it. and in the case actually it was a. Conti Ransom, the ransomware group called Conti, who have, a, I suppose, a, a relatively long history of carrying out very similar types of attacks against organizations of all shapes and sizes. And more often than not, it's not the first healthcare um, organization that they would have targeted. The, the same gang targeted a hospital group in Dusseldorf about a year before that. Um, and they see that as a good way of, of, I suppose, getting the biggest bang for their buck. Ultimately, they want a ransom paid in order to make as much money as possible. Um, and in the event that the ransom is paid, then the, the country or organization needs to put up with the, the, the disruption. But that's really focused, I think, in the last six months, the Irish government on the potential impact of cyber attack. It, 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 there's nothing like a cyber attack actually happening to put the focus on maybe funding cyber um, cyber defenses more and more, and I think I think we're going to see a, a you know a, a fairly dramatic improvement in how Irish government manages cyber and how Ireland in general manages cyber over the next number of years. Unfortunately, that is needed maybe just to stand still because, as I said at the very start, the types of attacks that we're seeing are becoming more and more um, sophisticated. There's more and more of them. Um, I think I, I think that's also maybe matched in in terms of you know if you look at the reporting around online fraud. There's been a 55% increase between 2019 and 2020. And for example, the number of phishing complaints that you know government's seen in the last year or so, again, there's been a 45, 50% rise. And that sort of rise is typically of is typical of what we see around the various types of cyber attacks that organizations have to defend themselves against, I suppose, on an ongoing basis. Um, but I but I do think from an Irish government perspective, there's probably a bit of hope in terms of greater. Um, resources being put into the place, but making sure that you know governmental organisations defend themselves better, but also that organisations in general and businesses in general, and in fact individuals, um, get a better sense of the types of things they need to be doing to defend themselves against um, cyber attacks. And it's actually worth mentioning that this, this, this is a sort of a, a global figure that's out there. This piece of research, where you know in 2020 there was 36 billion records compromised. And if you remember, I spoke earlier about people sharing username and password combinations on um, on, on various systems on the internet. This is why that's dangerous. You know, that's more than the total number of people in the world. There are databases publicly available on the internet with username and password combinations in the tens of billions. Um, and, but it's also worth noting that that number of compromised records was an over 300% increase on what happened in 2019. You know, was it COVID-driven? Were there other reasons? But it's just we're seeing a dramatic increase. We're going to see dramatically increased costs. And I think, you know, the numbers we come up with, I think, are just an estimate. But I think, you know, they're they're just going to grow over the next number of years. I think the challenge for organizations, you know, for individuals and for governments is to try and respond to that and try and manage their part of the internet or their part of their systems as much as possible. And just to give maybe a, a couple of recommendations for people and companies as well. And again, we can talk about this maybe more in more detail within the um, Q and A session in, in 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 a minute. Um, you know what's important for organisations when you need to implement um, security measures, um, antivirus, passwords, backup. You know, making sure that you understand what's important, and that's really around identifying your critical assets. You can't defend what you have in your IT systems unless you know what it is. You know, and I think once you know what it is, you put basic controls in place. But also, you need to make sure, and I think we mentioned this already, you need to think about what would happen if they're compromised. 
what steps would you take as an organization? Who would you need to get involved within the organization? Would you need ex external assistance? How would decisions be made? Because very often we find when organizations are the victims of cyber attacks, they can actually get make things worse by not having really considered what they would do or how they respond to it. Because when you're under pressure and a cyber attack is happening, people don't always make the best, um, best decisions. Um, and, and I suppose the last point just to leave you on, I think is really, really important. And hopefully this report helps maybe push that agenda a little bit. It's the whole issue of cyber awareness. Um, you know, people need to be both from an individual perspective, you need to be aware of the risks and be able to protect yourself when you go online. From a company perspective, the individuals within the company need to understand cyber attacks. They need to, they need to be able to spot a cyber attack. They need to know what not to do when sitting in front of their computers, not clicking on links you didn't know, not opening attachments, you don't know where they come from. That's really, really important. And I think particularly then finally from a government perspective, raising awareness of cyber crime but from an individual and a business perspective, I think it's going to be a key step in trying to minimize it over the next number of years. So, so that's really what I wanted to cover um, over, over the last 40 minutes or so. And maybe I know we've had some questions, but maybe I open up, I don't know, Andrea, if you want to open it up as well, um, just around if there's any further questions or comments or anything people would like to discuss in more detail. I think what I'll do as well, Mike, is if you don't mind, I'll put the link to this report that you've been talking about into the chat because a lot of people are asking for recordings and um, for the report. So we'll put that in. So one of the questions that has come in is, you know, where did you talk about the international? We've talked about Ireland, but where does Ireland sit in, in the international trends? Are we doing worse or better? I it, it's, it's quite difficult to say. I would think we're probably doing worse. Um, I, I think what we're what we're finding is that, particularly from a government perspective, compared to other maybe larger countries, we've probably invested we've 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 let, we've invested less in cybersecurity, certainly in the public sector. I think from a a, a, a private sector perspective, it's probably a little bit more to, it's a little bit more difficult to tell. I think if you go back five years ago, you probably we probably were behind. I think, for example, small and medium-sized enterprises, for example, dealing with, for example, if they're in the supply chain of a multinational, they actually get asked lots of security questions. They get, they get sort of the level of security has to be improved in order to even interact with these organizations. Um, so I think that's a challenge. I, I would say ultimately, I think we're probably behind. And some of that is to do with, you know, government didn't see it as big a problem. And I think in other countries, maybe the fact that they've had, for example, um, um, more of a history with it, for example, through um, the military side of things, or maybe with cer sort of certain industries, may, I think are probably ahead of us. But I do think we're going to have to, we're going to have to get better on this just because of the nature of the industry we have here. We have a lot of tech companies, you know, we, 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 we have a lot of digitization going on. We're a very digitally focused um, economy. So I think we just have to be better at this stuff. I think everybody has to be better at it. I've got a question here from John. John, I don't know, do you, would you prefer to unmute yourself and just ask the question yourself or should I ask it for you? Yeah, no problem, Andrea. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mike. Hey, John, how you doing? What's the right? Listen, just over the last 12 months, say, looking back at some of the incidents you've been involved in or investigated, say, especially in medium enterprise, subsequent to the the cleanup and investigation. Would any specific areas stand out to you that required significant improvement and spin and security wise, if you know what I mean? Yeah, but probably the two things are security awareness. So people knowing what to do, what, what to click on, what not to click on, recognizing a cyber attack. And then the second piece, and this is a challenge I know for SME and medium size is monitoring. So how do you know something bad is happening in a timely manner? So the deployment of you know, monitoring type technologies, whether it's Seam, et cetera. And, and, and like, it, it's been interesting. I'm, I'm seeing new products being developed all the time, maybe to help SMEs with this, but, but having appropriate levels of monitoring, I think is, is probably certainly the most expensive thing. And along with awareness, the most important thing, I think from SMEs, at least, at least the ones I've seen over the last, over the last year or so. If they'd, if they'd better monitoring in place, they'd have caught it earlier. If they'd better awareness in place, they'd, they'd, have, they'd have not done something stupid, you know? Yeah, interesting, good stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody else want to jump in? Um, we've got Mike still for another 15 minutes. 
I mean, I think you've covered this, but you know, you we talked about, you know, what should businesses do? Because it doesn't matter what size your organization is, whether it's five people or 5,000, everybody has finite resources, you know, whether it's know-how or time or money. So how do you prioritize and how do you know where to spend your money? Yeah, there, there's a really good, the National Cyber Center has a really good 12 steps to cyber the document. And um, so I, 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 I suggest any SME should have a look at that document. It's freely downloadable. It's on the National Cyber Center's website. It's very clear when you, when you go into the website where it is. And what does that do? That talks about sort of 12 steps organizations need to do from a cyber perspective. And it's everything from, you know, making sure, and I talked about this a little bit as well, making sure you understand what's important from a data perspective. Is it your customer lists? Is it your intellectual property? Is it designs or plans? If they were to go missing or if they were stolen, what would have the biggest impact in your organization? So then you know where maybe you want to spend your money. And then it's really about having the basics from a technical perspective in place, making sure you've got antivirus, making sure you're keeping your systems up to date, um, maybe considering some form of monitoring within your network, and that might be something your IT supplier might do on your behalf, but then also making sure that, that, that and I think this really is key for SMEs, is that awareness piece is making sure that your staff understand what a cyber attack looks like. They understand what's, what's, the, what's good and bad behavior when you're dealing with, uh, with, 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 a, with, 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 with IT systems, knowing don't click on the links, don't click on the um, attachments where you don't know where they come from, be conscious of social engineering type attacks. I think that's, that's, that's really the important thing. But if I was to say to an SME, I would say, look at that document, with that 12 steps. It's very simple language, it's got, but it's got the real, I suppose, clear risk management steps that organizations of all shapes and sizes should take. That's it. I mean, that just brings home the whole, you know, the cybersecurity onion. And there's no silver bullet. It's layers and layers and layers of loads of different things all on top of each other. And, and what, you have to, you know, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, and then what about ransomware? Obviously, that's like the top trend at the moment. Do you think we're going to see something new? Do you think 2022 is going to bring there will new always delights? Now, the, the one thing the one thing we can say is there will be something new. Modus operandi will change. Um, new new types of attacks will start developing. You know, there'll be there'll be different types. Like for example, the ransomware thing is interesting. If you look at the types of ransomware attacks we were getting like five years ago, relative to the quite sophisticated ransomware attack that the HSE was a victim of, um, they've gone from being, you know, traditionally they were highly automated. They were sort of very much they were sort of fire and forget. So you'd send, a, you'd send the attack or the piece of malicious software to lots of people and organizations and hope it works in a small number of them. Um, whereas the HSE attack was very targeted. It was actually people at the end of computers doing things. Um, the pieces of malicious software, the ultimate, the ransomware, was put in very, you know, they, they, they went around the network. They found the places where they caused the most damage. They would attempt to destroy um, backups as well as um, data that's live. So that they they make the effort they'll 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 basically focus on where they get the biggest bang for their effort. So if they're going to do it manually, it'll probably be targeted against large organizations. For individuals and smaller organizations, it'll probably tend to be more automated types of attacks, and and that's going to be a constantly changing piece. However, the defenses tend to be the same. It tends to be keep your systems up to date and have up to date proper antivirus, anti-malware um, software in place, start doing the, the new module. So when your malware vendor comes to you and says, well, we have a new, we have a new module that actually detects um, um, software based on bad behaviors rather than you know, it being known beforehand, that's a good thing. You might want to think about investing in that, but also making sure that your systems are kept up to date. Whether it's you, whether it's done in-house, or whether it's done by your IT provider, you need to make sure you keep your systems up to date. And then when someone leaves the organization, you take them off. When they move to one department or the other, the access they had is replaced by the new access so that they don't start gathering up more and more access. And I suppose really important in the current time is, is if you're doing remote access, do it securely. And there's some guidance in fairness on the, the National Cyber Center about how you might want to do that. Some of you would have heard about two-factor authentication. Having a minimum, you know, some form of two-factor in place is, is really, is really, really important. So it's, as you said, it is an onion, it is layered, you know, but there, there are steps you could take. And again, you're not, you're, not, you're not making yourself into a bank. What you need to do is just not make yourself the easiest. That's the important piece. Well, that brings us nicely onto this next question. Do the ransomware criminals ever get caught? Do they ever recover money back? Are we seeing more being caught now or less? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think it, I think there are more being caught now, but actually the number of people are doing it are larger. 
So is there a greater or less chance of being caught than there was previously, which is probably the, the best way to answer the question. I wouldn't think there is, but that's due to the sheer number of, of, of attacks and sheer number of gangs that are, that are doing this at the moment. What I would say is that, um, uh, what I would say is that cyber crime, uh, sorry, that law enforcement has got much better on this. You know, the guards are much better at this than they would have been a number of years ago, you know, where you could have argued five, six years ago, there was no point in reporting. Now there is a point in reporting because they may be that you, you're probably, if you're an individual, the victim of an attack, you're probably the victim of a fairly well-known common attack that they're dealing with lots of. So at a minimum, you know, it being reported allows them to get, get more resources to deal with this type of an attack. We are seeing and um, more criminal convictions. The challenge is it's internationally, they, people doing this don't necessarily sit in Ireland and they don't necessarily sit in jurisdictions that see this as being all very important. So actually from a law enforcement perspective, collaboration between different countries at the EU level is really, really important. And I think that's that's how we're, we're going to defeat it. So I think they're getting better. Are they winning the battle? That's questionable. Okay. And we always have a strong cohort of students on our calls. So any careers advice because obviously you started off life as a technical cybersecurity person and you've moved into the strategy side but i would say you draw on your technical expertise every day any advice for the students on the call yeah like no, look i think um i think cybersecurity is one area where you do need a broad range of knowledge from a technical perspective so i'm, I'm not i'm not entirely convinced that cyber is something you start doing straight from college it may be worth getting more general IT experience. I do think sysadmin background, even a development background, are very powerful from a security perspective. Because if you think about it, there are lots of different, it's not like 20 years ago where you did cybersecurity. There's now different types of cybersecurity. So you have people that, for example, um, help secure cloud environments. You have, you have other professionals that will help organizations um, code security. You'll have other individuals that help organizations from an organizational perspective set them up to defend themselves. So there are there are cyber jobs that are very technical. There are cyber jobs that are very much process driven. You need to have a think about that. But what I would say is I do think getting a bit of wider IT experience is 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 quite powerful. Thanks. Well, that that's actually great advice there because there's yeah there's a lot of. Um talk in the chat here, I'm just trying to catch up with it. People asking what courses to take. Um, I'm just saying what courses are best for SMEs. Um, I think if it comes to cybersecurity and things, if you want to learn it for your own businesses, even just starting at the, the lower level with the local enterprise offices, they run events all the time. And what we actually find is that they, they're not very well taken up because I don't know it, whether it's the overwhelm or the fear that they sold with, but there are there are a lot of resources out there, and you can always look on ITAG and Cyber Island for um, resources as well. Um, anything else? Any other questions, guys? Before um, we have to leave, Mike. <laughs> I, I see one question on um, that. Some of the the question around state sponsored attacks, um, and the, the question is: there's some evidence to show that the attacks around the time of Wizard Spiders attack on the agency are state sponsored. Can you speak to this? Um, yeah, like there, there's a haziness around state-sponsored attacks in certain jurisdictions. So, and what 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 do I mean by that? There are hacker groups that are effectively, at certain times, extensions of certain states. So they will carry out attacks on behalf of the state, and then other times they just do their criminal things. So there's there's a haziness between certain hacker or criminal gangs as to whether they're state-sponsored or not. In my view, they are state-sponsored. In my view, you could argue that the HSE attack was a state-sponsored attack, but uh, that's a lot for the, uh, the, the <laughs> I, I think that's a lot for the Irish state maybe to take up, but certainly the individual that carried out the attack would have had other times certainly carried out state-sponsored attacks. Maybe that's the best way to answer it. That's great, thank you. Um, any other questions before we go? I know somebody's putting here, is there a cyber network in Ireland and how and where do you join? Um, I, the first place I would always suggest you start is go to the Cyber Island website. We have events on the ITA, through ITAG. Um, we can put the link in there. With Cyber Tuesdays, there's always events. And I think the one thing that we're trying to get across to everybody is there's no gatekeeping. Because it's on Zoom, all these events are open to everybody. Um, Somebody's asking you on the HSE ransomware attack, do we know who were the actors and if ransomware were paid? I'm not sure you can comment on that, Mike, can you? 
Um, I can tell you the publicly available stuff. So, um, like in Conte Malware Group, there's various groups, but there's a sort of a overall sort of modus operandi that they used. The Irish government have said there was no ransom paid. There you go. Thank you. So there's a number of links that have gone into the chat for everybody, um, all sorts of resources. Um, and I suppose what I should also share with you, um, are you finished with your screen, Mike? I've just got one screen yeah, to share. No, yeah. Let me just stop sharing. Yeah. Um, it is, we, there is a call for papers. Uh, they've extended the deadline. And um, it's the Cyber Research Conference, which is happening in Ireland later. It's the first one ever. And you can go onto the website, which is cyber-rci.com. So the details are up on the screen. Um, please check it out. And anything else from anybody before we finish off? And thank you, thank Mike. Then we put a link to the, um, the Grant Thornton report, which I would say you were heavily involved in there, Mike. And that's been absolutely fabulous. And now we're just going to send you off to the UK to have a chat with Boris Johnson and let him know how you know, the cost of cybercrime and how it actually works. No problem. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. And uh, we will share the recording with you. No problem. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike.